to call this May 19th pre-meeting of the Buncombe County Commission to order. Thank you all for being with us. And um, there's been a request to move um, under staff updates to move the FY21 education requests from AB Tech, Buncombe County Schools, and Nashville City Schools up to the, um, to make that the first item on our agenda, if that's okay with everyone, because we got a lot of folks here and we'd like yes. to hear from them and then be able to let them go as we talk about our other items. So um, are there any questions about any other items on the agenda today? And there, are there any other items uh, any commissioners would like to uh, request to be added to the agenda? All right, thank you very much. Well, then let's go ahead and get started, and uh, we'll begin with the FY21 education request. And I think Jennifer, Jennifer Barnett, are you going to start us off on this, or are we going to start right with the schools? Good afternoon. I'll be, I'll be glad to start us. Um, I would like to invite um, Buncombe County Schools, and then Asheville City Schools, and then AB Tech. So um, if Dr. Tony Baldwin, I'll just let him come on up and begin. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good Chairman Newman, you just reminded me we had a long, we got a task force talking about restart. And one of the areas we talked about was policy because we, uh, we have a no bandanas, but we anticipate oh, really? we're going to see those in the high school for facial <laughs> nobody coverage. Told, nobody told me I'll, I'll bring a different one next time. Or <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you have a copy a paper copy of our PowerPoint, so um, hopefully the technology will work. I'm going to begin our presentation for Buncombe County Schools um, with the same two basic budget concept slides that, that I've uh, used for, I guess, the past eight years um, because we feel like it's so important these two slides reflect what I think we need to understand regarding our particular budget. And the first thing to understand is where our funding sources are, because it, it varies um, not, a, not quite a bit. Vast majority of school systems, public school systems across the state are very similar to, to ours in terms of funding sources. But you will notice that um, the vast majority, the 62.48% of our funds for operating expenses comes from the state. So that means we're highly dependent upon the state budget. I think you also can recall that we went without a, uh, a current budget. Everything was based upon the previous 18-19 uh, uh, school year budget but we're very dependent upon state funds. And then um, we come to the commissioners for the local portion of operating funds, and that's 29.35%. And then finally, the federal portion is 8.17%. Now, when I took office, I was fortunate enough to come in 09-10, right at the first little uh, recession, and you might recall the stimulus and stabilization funds that came in from the federal. So that percentage, I think at one time, Ms. Frisbee, I believe I'm right, went up to 14%. So sort of anticipate with what's coming from the federal uh, uh, government regarding COVID-19 relief that that number for next year will go up. But uh, we are still waiting, by the way, to see the first dollar drop to us for COVID-19 relief. And that may be true of the county as well. Our second slide again, basic concept. Where does our operating budget go? Probably no surprise because all of us in public schools, we're in the people business. So clearly 88% of our budget goes into salaries and benefits of our staff, our people. But those two slides, it's very important to understand both of those because I think that's at the core of what our budget represents in Buncombe County Schools. The next two slides represent, I'm gonna say, challenges to our budget. Uh, they represent some negative impacts that have occurred that we have to face. 
uh, and you will see that the first of those is a drop in membership, the enrollment piece. And that's been a, since 2014-15, you'll see that the pattern for the five years uh, was a decreased enrollment. Now, the good news that I'm able to report is that this current year, we actually put brakes on that particular slide and saw a slight increase, which is a positive. Um, we also, and it's important, I think, for the commission to realize that out of 115 school systems, we still have the 13th largest student enrollment of all systems across North Carolina. So we are considered a, a large school system. I'll also add that if it's something that keeps me up at night and probably keeps Dr. Short and other superintendents across the state, we really don't know what this enrollment pattern is going to look like as we step into August 17th. That's going to be a real challenge for us. But this is certainly one of those areas that we've, uh, we've really had to consider in terms of, of budget strategies. And there's been a similar pattern that has challenged our budget, and that's the decrease of available fund balance to support annual operating costs. Um, if we totally depended upon state funds to supply the salaries and the benefits for our staff, uh, we would really grossly um, lack in the ability to provide an efficient operations for our kids and meet the needs of our kids, especially certain populations of our students with, uh, that have certain uh, uh, challenges and additional needs. Uh, so with that said, this year, and I would focus on this year because you see that one number, you'll see that decline, again, that's uh, occurred since 13-14. This year, we project that we will essentially embed all of our fund balance to close out this school year, plus we're going to find ourselves in, in a negative. Now, we've also got to realize that we're in what's arguably the greatest challenge that public schools in North Carolina have ever seen. That may be true of, of Buncombe County. Um, so again, um, we're, we just can't, we're so anxious to see the Marines hit the beach or the cavalry come in on the white horses uh, with those federal funds because we're going to be highly dependent upon them. But essentially, our fund balance, as yours, is there for emergency purposes. And this has been, um, certainly from my career standpoint, the greatest emergency that we've seen. So uh, those are two areas that we have concerns with. And I also want to say that coming up here and, and requesting funds for next year, I want you to also understand that we have um, tried to do our work from Buncombe County Schools in, and we've identified uh, $2.1 million of um, cost strategies, cost reductions, but those funds are going to be dedicated to putting back in our fund balance because we operate on a daily basis. Uh, we have to forward fund. And essentially, that's what has been the tremendous challenge for us to forward fund what we had to in order to meet the challenges of this viral outbreak. And again, please stop me and ask any questions that you, that you have as, uh, as I proceed. I'll try to go slow enough to address any questions on the spot. Well, and I'm sorry, I must have missed that slide. That's the fund balance slide. I want you to see that. And you can see that pattern. Now, what I'm here to request is going to duplicate the area of funding that I've requested each of my 10 prior years as superintendent. Nothing's really changed. This is the basic. This isn't anything over and above. This is in order to maintain. And that particular area is all about our local employees and salaries and benefits. And the first thing I would emphasize to you, again, if we depended upon state funding and federal funding, to cover all the needs that we have for our employees to support adequately our students out in Buncombe County Schools, we would fall far short. So 20% of our total employees in our school system 
are locally funded. Where do those local funds come from? Primarily, they come from you as a commission. I will also tell you, and I've said this, I think each of those 10 years, I can proudly stand here and I hope you're proud to hear that across this state, your reputation is solid in terms of supporting our school system with those local funds. You're one of the top. And so I thank you for that and I appreciate that. Now, again, what, who are those local employees? What categories do they fall in? Well, the first category is you see there's 204 teaching positions. Now, if we didn't have these funds, what areas would it impact? We could see a, a sharp decline in providing arts. We would see a sharp decline in providing physical education and health. In essence, anything outside of the core areas our social studies, our math, our language arts, and our sciences. Those areas would be anything beyond that, um, we would fall short. So that's one area for local employees. The second is office support. Yes, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Uh, remind me how many, uh, how many schools are in the system? Uh, a total of 44. One of those is a program, PEP, but we consider that a school, Mr. Belcher. All right, thank you. Uh, on the office support, that's your receptionist, that's your bookkeeper, that's your data manager. The state does not pay for those positions. And as you can imagine, if you did not have clerical support here running the county, what that would look like. Uh, skilled trades, that's our maintenance department. And I'm proud to say how many times I've been able to stand in front of you and tell you what our maintenance department over the years has saved millions and millions of dollars for, to this county and our schools. Um, School-based specialists, that's our district or central office. And I will tell you that when you look at our size and you look across the state, that we're one of the leanest, we're also one of the meanest central offices across the state. Uh, we function, I believe, very efficiently with our numbers. Uh, you'll see instructional assistance. That's in kindergarten through third grade. That's our STEM labs. Some of you have actually visited those. I've walked through them with you. Uh, it also includes media assistance. Again, state funds aren't provided for those particular areas. Technicians, administrative specialists, that's our technology. Where we have been these, these past three months without our technology people. And I'm proud to say I, th I think we did a, um, an excellent job of providing on the spot the type of vir virtual instruction that was required at the time. Um, other assistants, a number of those positions there, those 33 positions are behavioral specialists and you've heard me talk in the years past quite a bit about social, emotional, behavioral health and the behavioral specialists uh, are, they, they've been in place now for two years and I think they're considered by our principals and our teachers as absolutely VIPs out there to help us address some of the needs that we're seeing, especially with our youngest children starting in kindergarten. Um, the assistant principals, again, the state doesn't provide enough uh, funding to cover the needs and the support that takes place out in our schools. And instructional support, that's instructional coaches. Um, they've been in place for about seven years now. And again, they're considered VIPs. They go in classrooms, they work side-by-sides with teachers, they provide professional development in areas of curriculum and instruction. They're absolutely valuable. And, I, and a lot of what I'm describing, I think Dr. Short, um, she, she would agree because they're very similar functions in Asheville City Schools. Dr. Baldwin, one other question. Mm -hmm. uh, and you may, have, you may have said this. On the instructional assistance, that typically what we refer to as teacher assistance. Uh, the, and I'm particularly interested in the K through three. You know, I've been a, um, an advocate of that over the years and making sure that we have, have those positions there. Do you know the, the, the total number of teacher assistants that are used in K through three in Buncombe County? Ms. Frisbee, you got uh, just a ballpark number on that. Pardon me? 250. 250. So approximately five. Five per school. -ish. Five. Well, that's that's an approximate number. We have a range in in and, and it's all based upon again the the size, the the number of kindergarten through third grade classrooms, 
And I will tell you that another factor that's going to impact all of us is the reduction in class size K3 because it not only impacts your facility because you may have to add additional classrooms and where do they come from. We're fortunate in Buncombe County because we have intermediate schools and one of the benefits of intermediate is it opened up space back at the elementary levels. That's um, why we did it, yeah. So, so those, that, that's going to be, be an impact on us because if you add another classroom K3, we have um, we made a decision in kindergarten and first grade that is that's mandatory we're going to have one assistant in those classrooms so if we add a classroom we add that that assistant state's been able to help us somewhat with that but again they do not cover the funding of teacher assistance for Buncombe County Mr. Belcher uh, it covers about I'd say about 65 to 70 percent we cover the rest with our local and again, you've been in those classrooms and you've heard firsthand those are, those are most valuable uh, people in those classrooms to help our teachers. Sure. Um, the managers and maintenance, maintenance, that's the supervisors that work in the various areas, whether it's HVAC, plumbing, electrical, uh, they're licensed, they coordinate the work teams that go out. And again, we're so proud of the, the energy cost savings that we've been able to provide uh, through that maintenance department. Uh, and then the directors and supervisors, that's our central office leadership. And again, I, I think we, we certainly can, uh, can uh, prove that we are uh, highly efficient there. You know, you know I want to make this personal to you because when we, because what happens, um, and, and let me just give you, give you this vision, uh, Owen Middle School, we identified two teachers of the years. These are the best of the best. Caroline Ayers, who is our 2020 Teacher of the Year, and then Bill, Fe Bill Feste, uh, longtime veteran, uh, Teacher of the Year in 2008, actually uh, Teacher of the Year for the, for the county. Um, Owen Middle School, both of them teach in the same school. Uh, they're on the same hallway. Well, Mr. Feste is paid out of state funds. Ms. Ayers is paid out of local funds. So here's what happens. And I use the term, you've heard me use the term non-negotiable. It's non-negotiable for us because it's decided by the state. When the decision in Raleigh is to raise salaries, uh, when those salaries are raised, they provide funding for state funded. But there you go, Mr. Festy gets the raise. We have a local funded staff person on the same hallway again best of the best teachers of the year that would not receive that without your generous contribution now the same thing with benefits again non-negotiable and my request is really going to focus this year on benefits because of COVID-19 um, we anticipate that we're not going to be coming to you about those salaries now I say that I'm going to preface by saying we might have to come back you might have me knocking back on the door but we anticipate that this is going to be, be a year where um, the likelihood of those salaries m certainly aren't as great as they've been in years past. Benefits, retirement rate, uh, the employer's cost, the uh, health insurance rates, they've gone up every single year that I've been superintendent. This is my 11th year. So every single year we've come back with this same <coughs> dilemma. We have locally funded teachers, 20% of, of our staff, We've got the other state funded. State funded is taken care of, but not our local. And we believe that it's a, an it's issue of equity, that they deserve that. Any questions? Because that's, that's quite a key for us. And, and again, these, these are the standard requests that come in. These are the basic requests. This isn't, isn't in anything that's over and above. Okay, I left the... Uh, this particular page blank because again we do not anticipate uh, but they could occur and if so similar to this year we would need to come back to the Commission for assistance just to give you an idea of what that looks like traditionally we um, estimated at 5% increase that's pretty historical over the years and for that, again, local employees, if that 
non-negotiable raise came from the legislature, that represents $2,143,805 in order to cover those local employees. For non-certified, we estimated at 3%. That's pretty standard, the 3% that we've seen. Anything from really from one to three. And that includes FICA, it also includes supplement increases. That's at 617,000. Now again, it's zero there, but I just wanna leave you with, with, the, um, with the thought that that's, that's normally what we bring to the table and could come back to you again. And Dr. Baldwin, we're going to yes. need to wrap it up in just a second so we make sure we have time for... Okay, I'm, 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 on a, I'm on fast track. Uh, bottom line, retirement health insurance. We total those up. Requests coming to you, $1,490,676. That covers both of those areas, and that covers our local employees. I put a slide in here, and you're welcome to take time and look at that thoroughly and ask questions to me later. Return on the investment. Um, I talked to you about performance grades. I've done a lot of that in the past. It's 80% performance, 20% growth. We think that's wrong. We think growth should be higher. Uh, we put a lot of work in those four schools that were below a C. So the sad part about it is we're not going to have performance grades this year, and, and we have had employees, staff that have worked, worked, and worked, and we were very optimistic. We're also proud of our growth. I'll let you look at those. Uh, again, we, we feel extremely, extremely proud of, of what we've seen with our growth. And I'm going to leave you with um, three slides. I want to leave on a real positive note, and I want to thank you, especially with one of those. When COVID-19 hit, uh, our schools closed down on March 16th. We talked to the board, and we had three essential goals. These are the three things we got to do. Number one, we got to keep meals going to all of our kids and our families that need them. We started that March 16th, did not miss a beat. The second thing is we said that we've got to provide instruction. It's got to continue. We provided virtual instruction. We sent out 1,250 hotspots. I know Mr. Belcher asked me a question regarding uh, how do we connect out there because we still do have issues. 93% of our students, when all the dust cleared, had that ability to connect on the internet. We are one-to-one, -one. computers got home within two days, and boom, we didn't miss a beat. And then finally, keep our employees whole. We have not had to reduce force. We have maintained the salaries of all of our employees throughout. Uh, three quick things, face shields, very proud of that. EOC, Mr. Huff, who's our contact representative, we are able to make um, 250 face shields, and we're starting production next week because we're going to be making them for our employees. Uh, we're producing that. Uh, we did it through our 3D printers, brought every 3D uh, printer into the Buncombe County School Central Office, and we had an assembly line. Uh, very proud of that. And that's Laurel Bates, by the way. I promised her I'd recognize her. That's our office uh, manager for Mr. Huff. And then uh, Family Resource Center. You've heard this before. We have over 500 homeless students and families in Buncombe County Schools. That's a challenge. We also have some very high at-risk populations. Again, March 16th, first day we were closed, we were providing lunch and breakfasts to those individuals. And we were also identifying this high at-risk group in our Family Resource Center and we delivered since, uh, since the end of April 3,462 meals and other hygiene type projects. We've got baby diapers going. This is on a daily basis. We're going out because some of those families can't get to our sites where the meals are being provided. It's a tremendous service. And then finally, I know I'm running out of time, Chairman Newman, and that's our school nutrition. Uh, tremendous thanks, Lisa Payne, our staff. Um, and I want to thank the commissioners. This is your thank you. It's a good thing for me to end on uh, because you provided that extra pay incentive. That's the only way we were truly able to run our program over spring break. And uh, since March 16th, seven, get this now, 764,400 meals. I didn't even get the current date, current number. 
and that would be higher than that. But that's been provided through this staff. And again, had we not, did you not come through, uh, our people were tired. They were, they were worn out. So that little incentive helped tremendously. So again, uh, any questions? All right, thank you very much, Dr. Baldwin. Uh, we appreciate it. I'm sure we will have more going forward. So um, if this is a great, uh, great way to uh, get this conversation started and to highlight the priorities. So thank you very much for being here today. And are our city schools going second? Great. All right, Bobby Short, great to see you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. This is my third time around, and pretty soon I'm going to rival my friend Tony Baldwin's record of standing up before you. He's got the 10 year record, but I'm closing in. So um, it's delightful to be with you today. We want to share with you our request, but we also want to share with you here's my clicker, my beautiful clicker coming. We want to share with you also um, how we are spending our funds, especially our supplemental tax dollars. We want to share with you a little bit about this year's focus and then our ask, and there are four asks that are coming from Asheville City Schools. Just to give you an idea of our uh, population, we have 4,400 students. We have 744 staff members. We have 10 schools. Um, and we have uh, high school, two high schools, two middle schools, and six elementary schools. In looking at our demographics, it's very interesting to note that um, in 2004, our black student population was at 45.7%. It has steadily declined to what it is today. And the reason for that is the fact that our families of color cannot afford to live in Asheville. So we continue to lose that population. And you will also notice that there are 10 housing communities in Asheville, Buncombe County, and Asheville City Schools serves nine of those housing communities. communities. <coughs> 33 percent of our students live in our housing communities or are either homeless students. And actually the number is probably higher than 33% because sometimes there are two and three families in a unit in the housing communities. I want to share just a little bit of our data, the performance goals. Uh, when you look at our grades for the, last year's data, all of our schools earned a C or better as a performance grade. And from 2017-18 to 2018-19, we increased from 44% of our schools to 66% of our schools meeting or exceeding growth. We celebrate these increases. We do a good job, but we don't do a good job for all of our students all the time. At the same time, we look at our growth we know that our achievement gap has remained among the highest in the state, and we continue to focus on closing that gap. We would like to share with you some of the specifics of how we're using our local dollars, and especially looking at that extra supplemental tax dollar figure that we get in Asheville City Schools that we are privileged to receive. When you look at the local dollars that we receive, it's a little bit different from Buncombe County, I think because of the supplemental tax dollars. Actually, we receive about $10 million, $9.9 .9 million in that, uh, with that allotment. And you can see our state dollars are at 40%, our local dollars. You serve us so well, and we are so grateful. Almost 35% comes from local funds. How do we spend our local dollars? Now, this is not how we spend all of them, but it's certainly how we look at that uh, almost $10 million of supplemental tax money. Almost all goes to personnel, just as Tony was saying in Buncombe County. In Asheville City Schools, we have 103 local teaching positions. That's an art, music, PE, digital lead teacher at every school. 
We have elementary Spanish program, K-5. We have instructional facilitators. Those are the coaches, teacher coaches at every school. We also have smaller class sizes because of the teacher-pupil ratio. In our uh, K-3s, we have about 15 students per class. Four and five, about 18 students per class. In middle school and high school, we have about an average of 20 in our classrooms. Smaller class sizes is definitely a plus for us. We also are able to fund 41 teacher assistants. And that gives us a teacher assistant in every K-2 classroom. Good job, Dr. Short. Thanks. How we spend our local dollars, uh, also in support staff. We are emphasizing mental health and social emotional needs. We always could use more support and our need is always greater than our resources. We spend 1.1 million of our local dollars to support our mental health issues. Preschool is very important to us, $1.2 million. We spend in 11 preschool classrooms across the, the district, and also we have listed the other sources that would include 1.5 million, uh, the Buncombe County Early Childhood Grant is a part of that. Again, we are grateful to you for the opportunities that our children have. Exceptional Children's Program, <clears throat> about $800,000. We have not had an increase in federal funding in EC funding in the last 20 years, uh, a rough estimate. The state does historically cover any increase in salary and benefits. We also have special programs. AVID is a program that serves our first generation college bound students and 99% of these students are students of color. This year, we have 38 seniors who are a part of the AVID program, and they all are going to college. We also are able to extend our summer school programs. We have extra tutors because of the local dollars, and we also are able to offer a summer program three weeks for our most vulnerable students at the middle school and um, that's about 100 to 150 students that we serve and then we are able to give funds to our schools and we base that on the size of the school and the special needs of the school and that amounts to a, another half million dollars like to share briefly with you our this, this year's go goals and our focus. We would like to spend a couple of minutes looking at this. We have spent this year addressing our achievement gap in a very systematic, uniform way. We have aligned our work and our spending with our equity focus to ensure growth of all of our students. And throughout this year, we have really tried to prioritize what our goals are what the end result should be, and our spending to match our goals. Our two greatest challenges, number one, of course, is the achievement gap, and number two is to engage the community <clears throat> in addressing and understanding the opportunity gap. Those are two different things. They affect directly, again, a third of our student population. The achievement gap and the opportunity gap go hand in hand. The achievement gap you've heard about, it is the disparity in academic performance between subgroups of students. The opportunity gap are the environmental factors which hinder our students from achieving. And those are the very factors that you work on as a commission's board. And those are the very factors that we work on as a community. Those opportunity gaps include such items as affordable housing, a decent minimum wage, having food on the table, and in a piece of research that we have included in your packet, in 95 out of 100 metro areas across this nation, these same factors are true, that the children who experience these negative factors experience 
lack of opportunity as compared to the white population, and it is the children of color. Let me tell you how that looks in a classroom. We have children who come to us who eat their lunch, maybe at 11 o'clock, sometimes <coughs> as early as 1030, and they do not get another meal until they come back to us the next morning. We have had children who come to us with bed bug bites all over their bodies. We have children who are trying to do their homework. No one's at home to help them because they may live with a single parent mom. She may have two or three jobs. She's not home in the evenings. She wishes she could be, but she has to put food on the table. And then lastly, in this community, and I'm talking about things that all of us own in this district and in our county. We have drive-by shootings. Our children maybe are trying to sleep. They may be trying to do their homework, and they are unsafe with shootings going on in their backyard or across the street. So all of these are calls for alarm for all of us, especially when it affects a third of our school population. So as we look at our challenges, we have developed very specific strategies to address these areas. We've had an initial district-wide group setting meeting of, from representatives from all of our schools early in August, and we developed the long-term goals for this year that have driven our work and our purpose. That first goal is to focus on core instruction. And all that really means is how we teach and what we teach and using data to see who got it and who didn't. Our second goal has to be to develop a comprehensive social emotional framework. We do not have that in Asheville City. We will have it in place uh, by the opening of the school year and are well on our way right now to that being ready to implement. Our third goal has been to strengthen our own lines of communication, especially between the central office and our schools. And our emphasis has been on teamwork in everything that we do in Asheville City Schools because it takes every one of us in looking at the achievement gap and the opportunity gap to accomplish our goals. And goal number four is very specific this year. It is to and was to establish an after school program at every elementary school, which would have tutors, which would have a snack. If you have lunch at 1030 or 11, at least you have a snack in the afternoon before you come back for breakfast the next morning. We have been able to do that by reallocating our local dollars. And it's so important for children to have a safe place to go in the afternoons without going to a home that may not have any supervision there. So again, of our, our use of local dollars. We have also been able to have uh, reading teachers to work with small groups of students, retired teachers that we brought back using the funds that you have given us from third through uh, fifth grades to give small group instruction. And then we, this year we have developed an equity plan we didn't have any consultants. Um, this was all homegrown equity work from all of the representatives of our schools focusing on what we know, the prior knowledge that we have had, and we have not used any outside consultants this school year. We have relied on our own expertise, on our own foundation, and we also have used the black scholars in our community to guide our work. This year's equity plan has focused on three areas. Again, getting back to core instruction. <clears throat> who gets it, who doesn't, and how do we reteach and use of assessment constantly to see who needs uh, some reinforcement with skills. There are two other important things that we have been able to do instructionally this year because of the local dollars. And that is number one, to purchase a new math program for our K-5, all of our elementary schools. Do you know how expensive uh, a math program is, K-5, for all of our schools? We only have six, $200,000. 
So we negotiated and they let us pay 100,000 this year and 100,000 next year and we reprioritized our funding and so we have been able to fund that. We've also been able to fund new reading materials for fifth grade students for next year to the tune of $40,000, just one grade level. And we think that's gonna make a real difference in the delivery of instruction. Since March 16th, <clears throat> the day school closed, Tony's already alluded to that, we have been presented the third greatest challenge, the, perhaps the greatest challenge that we will face in this century in terms of COVID-19. Our schools were closed on Monday the 16th. We had a teacher work day. And the second day, we were ready to begin at-home learning. And we did on Tuesday. And the reason we were able to do that, again, is because of local dollars. We have those lead digital teachers in our schools. We had the technology needed. Our kids had their devices. So uh, we are grateful to you for that. A little bit about our response to COVID-19. We are serving not as many meals as Tony because Buncombe County is six times larger than we are, but we are serving 1,500 meals a day. Up to this point yesterday, we had served 51,569 meals. We start our summer uh, program June the 1st, and we anticipate we'll be serving 90,000 meals across the district. Uh, other responses to our COVID-19, our teachers have been tremendous. We even have our art and music teachers delivering lessons remotely. So we are so proud of the effort that has gone into our, uh, from on behalf of our staff. We call students on a regular basis. We have everyone in the district calling, teacher assistants, teachers, SRO officers, everyone, to check on kids, especially those we know that may not be as actively engaged. Uh, this last slide on home learning shows that we have been away when the end of the school, and that will be May the 29th in Asheville City Schools. We have, our children have been away from direct face-to-face -face instruction for 10 weeks. And that translates into 282 hours. And I will echo what Tony said. The greatest challenge is coming. We haven't seen the greatest challenge yet. The greatest challenge is going to be in getting our children back to school because we have to social distance. We're going to have to run two or three different loads of buses just to get our children to school. How do you keep kindergartners wearing a face mask all day? How do you walk into a classroom and check all the temperatures? So uh, the challenge is yet to come. Our ask, and I'm gonna be real quick with our ask. Thank you. The first thing we want to do is maintain our current appropriations. If you'll just give us next year what you gave us last year, we will be grateful. The second request is what Tony alluded to and that is to look at the increased retirement and hospitalization cost for our local positions. And that's another $973,000. The last two requests that we have are very specific to Asheville City Schools. This year, we had a salary study, and we looked at the positions you see there, our teacher assistants, custodians, maintenance, if you will, probably the lowest paid salaries when you compare teacher salaries and principal salaries. And the total cost to implement this salary study, to put everyone on their right step for 130 employees is $473,000. Now we're not asking for that. We're just asking for phase one, which will look at our teacher assistants. And Mr. Belcher, we have 99 teacher assistants in Asheville City Schools and we would like to give them credit for the years of experience that they have had. Look what a teacher assistant makes. And this is not just in Asheville City Schools, this is across the board. Teacher assistants have been frozen for eight years. They make, in our district, a range of $21,000 to $28,000. And that is before taxes. So when you talk about the opportunity gap, it focuses on our own employees. 
If you will look at the next slide, uh, when we at the salary study showed us, if you move from Winston-Salem to Asheville, you are going to pay 51% more in housing here in Asheville. And if you move from Durham, housing is going to cost about 32% more. How can we expect anyone to live in Asheville when you make $21,000 a year? Again, our request is to support this phase one of the salary study. And lastly, this is an easy ask. Uh, we need a part-time coordinator for our after-school programs, $35,000, to coordinate what is happening to make sure that children have a safe place to be in the afternoons. And I will tell you also, if we don't get that, we're going to ask the city for it too. So we're kind of hedging our bets there. <laughs> The last slide is a thank you for everything you have done for us. We are tremendously grateful. And I would like to take the opportunity to introduce to you the new Asheville City School Superintendent. In eight days, you're going to have a new superintendent. Mr. Freeman, Dr. Jean Freeman, would you just stand up? I won't let him come up to the podium because he talks as much and as fast as I do, and we know we got to move on, but he is going to be outstanding in moving our district forward in looking at assessment and instruction and making things better for kids as we meet them on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you for welcoming him. Thank you for welcoming me today and for listening to our request. And Mr. Newman, thank you for the extra time. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Dr. Short. And Dr. Freeman, um, welcome you to Asheville and Buncombe County. Look, we look forward to working with you and, and everyone on the city schools team as well. Thank you all for being here. Um, any, yes, ma'am. Any, yes, let's keep it. Editorial comment, please. Yeah, let's, let's be keep, short. It, keep it pretty short. Uh, Bobby, and I can say this because we're old friends, uh, thank you for all you've done. But I'd like to really give a message to our new superintendent who I'm looking forward to working with, the chair of the school board, too. We've had you three times, Bobby, as <laughs> superintendent. And I noticed something. Each time you left, what little progress you made left with you. I hope this time that we will be able to continue and build on the good work that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate may just, it. May I just say one thing? Uh -huh. um, I appreciate the opportunity to work here, and you're right. Dr. Short has built on uh, several good ideas and is moving forward. Uh, my plan is, if the good Lord keeps me healthy, to be here at least five years. If within those five years, you have not seen substantial improvement, I'm speaking to my bosses and to you folks, I'll write you a check for my last year's salary. <laughs> We're gonna hold you to that. <laughs> well, I, won't <laughs> I won't give my money up. <laughs> but I will do that. Right. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Uh -huh. Okay, next up is AB Tech. Do you know her presentation? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they were. Sure were. Well, I agree. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'll unmask myself. <laughs> Dirk Wilmoth, uh, Vice President for Business and Finance and CFO. Good to see you all again. Our presentation, thank you. Uh, this is going to be short and sweet. Sweet, uh, Even though we've been asked to think outside the box in order to uh, determine how we're going to adjust our budget, our, our activities, our mission uh, in this new uh, environment, 
uh, we, we also know that it's not time to think outside the box in terms of how to spend the taxpayers' uh, money. And so this will be short and sweet. If you'll change, do I get a, do I control this? Yes, thank you. Uh, we are, uh, based on the request that we receive, uh, we have decided that we can live within the budget that we have. So it will be a zero increase budget. And uh, we also project that, uh, that we will be able to maintain uh, the reserve that we had starting the year, probably maybe a little bit larger just because we've seen a downturn in our expenses related to energy expense, obviously. Uh, you can see overall uh, this uh, the total revenue that we were working on this year was seven, almost $7.1 million. And you can see that 5, 000, a million of that was from the Article 46 revenues per our agreement. And then the balance, which you generously gave us this year, of just over almost $2.1 million. And you can see our actual, so we feel like we're as if we're tracking very nicely against our budgets at that point at the end of April at 83%. On, on the revenue side. And then what we've asked for is a duplication on the revenue side, $7.098 million. On the expense side, we're tracking very similarly. Uh, salary and benefits, you'll see no change there at 83%. Operations uh, at 76%, uh, uh, $2.4 million budget. And utilities at 76% at the end of April, when, uh, which is a little bit behind a pro rata. So the total expenses of um, uh, $5.6 million against a $7 million budget, 79%. So our requested budget duplicates what we've done this year, and we feel very comfortable with that. And all the more reason we feel comfortable is that we, have, uh, we've, we feel as if we are preparing to be frugal, and we also anticipate that due to some of the investments that you're, you have made in the, in the college, that we'll be able to continue to be uh, extremely frugal during the year. We have the ongoing schedule of capital repairs and replacements funded by Article 46, approximately $3 million a year over a 10-year period, and they are beginning to have a demonstrated uh, impact, positive impact on our energy expenses, and so that gives us some sense of security. Also, because of Article, as a result of Article 46 and your generosity, we've been able to, uh, we're in the process of switching out 7,000 lamp fixtures on our Victoria Road campus and uh, switching them out with LEDs. And uh, that is projected to save us about $90,000 a year based on the preliminary study that was done by Landis Guy and the, the folks out there. The energy management module uh, that we are implementing as we go through with our ongoing uh, schedule of capital repairs and replacement, uh, it does involve uh, having more control in more places on our campus, approximately a million square feet of campus. Uh, we also have a Beth, uh, Beth Gentry, who is here today, uh, she, is, uh, she has gone through the process of, of becoming a, a state certified energy manager. And so we're, again, seeing to uh, controlling the expenses related to something that can obviously uh, reap uh, benefits for us through increased uh, efficiency, efficiency. And then finally, we, we employed a company this year as the telecommunications expenses, which were being covered for several years by the state budget. Uh, were moved back to the county budget this past, this past year. We did a thorough audit and employed a company to come in and, and identify savings there where there were lines, trunks that were not being used, line, uh, cell phones not being used, and we identified approximately $25,000 of savings uh, that will be moving forward as a savings in the budget. So all of these convinced us that we are be able to live with what we've been given and we're so grateful uh, for that. And uh, look, we know that you have great challenges this, this year and we know that uh, uh, we will be very happy with what you can give us this year as far as a no-change budget. Are there any questions? Derek, would you introduce the interim president, even though he's only going to be with us for a short while longer? Yes. <laughs> yes, since February 1st, our interim president has been uh, Dr. Joseph Barwick, and he has been with us throughout this. He came. He came uh, right as the coronavirus started taking off, and so he's been leading us through that uh, admirably. And uh, he's been a real, uh, with his experience uh, as a college president for 10 years at Carteret, yeah. uh, he, he has the maturity, and obviously he has the maturity, but <laughs> he, has the, he has the wisdom, too, on top of that. We're in, he is able to uh, really uh, calm the community as need be and, and invigorate Good. us and lead us, uh, and he's been a real asset. We wish we, we could keep him longer. 
but uh, he'll be serving through July 1st. Thank you, Derek. You're welcome. All right. I just have one question. Um, and I'm sure there could be a real, I'm sure you could probably talk about this for an hour, but uh, just in maybe a real short version, you know, with the, um, obviously we know a lot of educational activities have been disrupted, shut down, done differently, uh, and there's, we're still going to be working through some of that. But, you know, just with the um, economic challenges that we're facing, um, my general understanding is that a lot of times when we face recessionary environments, attendance at community college actually goes up, so. right? Because people yeah. are like, well, I'm not working right now, so I want to get some new skills and training so I can maybe uh, get a better job or a different job. So when we don't know how long this is going to last, hopefully it's not too long, but is the community college sort of forecasting that uh, attendance over the next, you know, year or two might be elevated as a result of the economic environment? Well, we, we anticipate that that will be the case ultimately. And uh, in our summer school, I believe our numbers have held up very well, even though by and large we're uh, re remote learning. So uh, we anticipate that yes, indeed, there will be an increase. And that's why we're reluctant to cut back on things too much because we think at some point we'll, we'll be yeah. uh, filling our facilities again. The question, I think, is the mode of delivery, you know, to what extent is this a permanent switch uh, you know, to an online learning? And uh, we believe that that is not the ideal for every, every particular discipline, so therefore uh, we anticipate the, the, the students will be back on campus. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Any other questions, commissioners? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for your service as well, Dr. Barwick. We appreciate it very much. All right, um, that concludes our three presentations from our education partners. And um, so next up on our agenda is gonna be the Federal Home and Community Care Block Grant item. And Stoney Blevins will be um, you know. helping us out on this one. And then Tony is too okay. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. I believe we have a PowerPoint presentation, yeah. So I wanted to come and talk to you today about uh, the pre-meeting about the Home and Community Care Block Grant uh, funding for the county and um, some recommendations that we would like to make this year that may be just a little bit different than years past. Uh, we've really done a deep dive into this and looked at how we've been administering it, been working with our aging partners about maybe the most effective and efficient way to administer it and wanted to bring those uh, recommendations to you at the next commissioner's meeting. So just to give you a little history, okay. So the um, Home and Community Care Block Grant are really aging funds. It's part of our funding strategy in the county to fund aging providers across the community. Um, all the services that are provided by these agencies are for citizens age 60 and older. The allocations for these funds this year was projected to be 1.5 506192 the actual state allocation just came in today and the amount is uh, right at one million five hundred and one thousand one hundred thirty two dollars if my memory serving right so we will have to adjust our uh, allocation strategy just a little bit before we come to you in a couple of weeks one thing about this is the BOCC has responsibilities outlined in the state policy regarding these funds and it's really a couple of things. So one is every year the commissioners must designate a lead agency for these funds. And the purpose of that lead agency is to be responsible for the planning of how the funds will be spent, who will receive the funds. Um, and then we bring, and then that group brings you the funding plan each year. Uh, we also uh, need the commissioners to serve um, as a block grant a committee that is a block grant advisory committee. We have historically called this the allocations committee in Buncombe County because their primary purpose is to receive the applications from the various service providers across the community, look at the policy, and then determine the best use of these federal funds to meet our community needs as outlined in our aging plan. Um, then this uh, committee submits the funding plan uh, to the area age on agency we enter to a grant agreement and also wanted you to know in addition to these federal funds as you well know we also provide an additional half a million dollars to support these same agencies uh, in county dollars to expand our reach 
and go further into the aging community for a total of just over $2 million. Historically, for the last 10 years, and maybe just a little longer, we have contracted with Land of Sky Regional Council to serve as the lead uh, agency for these funds and also to administer our county dollars. Um, they've done a fine job of it, um, but in talking to them, a couple of things we've looked at, we've always been in a supportive role, we've always sat on the allocations committee, um, and we really had Land of Sky to appoint that, that advisory committee. We did not bring that back before the commissioners as a part of that contract. Uh, we've done some research, we've had our county legal to look into it, and uh, while we can't go back, we discovered that actually it is still the role of the commissioners to appoint that committee, whether another agency serves as um, lead agency or not. So as we move forward for recommendations, we're really asking that this year you appoint Buncombe County HHS to serve as the lead agency. And we have several reasons for that. One, in looking at our budget this year, we really did a deep dive. We've been doing it, honestly, ever since I got here to ask ourselves, are there places where we contract for a service that we could possibly do ourselves, but without adding any FTEs? Could we absorb some of our contract services into our existing structure, add a savings to the county? This was one place we felt we could do this. But we've also been planning this uh, for really for a year with Land of Sky, uh, who serves as our aging on agency, and they actually support this move. They don't really do this for other counties in our service region, and they would actually support Buncombe County taking on the lead agency. So our first reason was because we felt like it was a better return on investment of taxpayer dollars. That's $30,000 we can use somewhere else. Um, the second thing is our partner wants us to do this. We also need to, um, uh, it also brings some consistency in our county dollars because this is one of the few areas where we would actually contract with a third party to determine how we use our county dollars. And so this would move the 500,000 in county dollars under county administration at HHS, and we would run it just like we run all of our other county contracts, including our RFP process, contract oversight, and those type of things. I do wanna say as a point of fact though, we are not doing this because Land of Sky has not done a good job because they have done a wonderful job and they've really gone beyond the scope of their work to serve us, and I want to make sure we make that point clear. Uh, so that's one request we would bring before you on June 2nd, is to appoint HHS as the lead agency. The other is what you do every year, which is to recommend and approve the funding plan for these federal dollars, um, as recommended by the current advisory committee or allocations committee, um, and then later, if you, appoint, if you appoint HHS, I couldn't make this recommendation today, then we will bring a recommendation for a, and, um, I keep wanting to call them the allocation, the HCCBG Advisory Committee for State Fiscal Year 21. And that committee has actually gotten somewhat small, and we want to make a proposal to expand it a bit to make sure that we um, have adequate representation across the aging community, including a member, you know, persons in that age group. So we'll bring you a recommendation in July uh, should you appoint us as the lead agency. So now I open up for questions. I also have Jen T with me, and I'd like for you to meet Jen. Uh, there, Jen is our, um, our a adult and aging manager. We've, she's been with us just a few months now, has a long background in aging services, uh, has served in Ashe County in that role, was also the Council on Aging Director here in Buncombe uh, before we persuaded her to come over and work for the county. So she's doing a lot of fantastic work, and she would actually be uh, the leader of these services if the county takes back over this role. All right, thank you, Stoney. Any questions, commissioners? I think so. Thanks. All right, thank you for the update. We appreciate it. We'll okay, look thanks. forward to talking further about it. All right, uh, and next up is a uh, discussion of county reopening plans, and Sybil Tate will help us out with this item. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm here to give you an update on reopening for the county. Okay, which one do I push? All right, I hope I can figure this out. Um, so just a bit of um, 
background for you. As you know, um, we did close the county facilities when the COVID crisis began. Um, however, we continue to provide services during the crisis. Um, the goal with that closure was to um, ensure safety for our employees um, and essentially limit the face-to-face -face interaction with citizens and other employees. So you'll see on the screen just a few of the bullets explaining what we did to limit that um, interaction. We did have some departments such as Parks and Rec and the library who were impacted more in terms of the services that they could prov provide. Um, but we did reassign some of those employees to other needs within the county. The next slide talks about the plans that we're putting into place um, to allow us to reopen to the public. Um, again, safety is our top priority in this situation. We want to make sure our facilities are safe for the public and also for our employees. Um, with that in mind, we have met with department heads and public, um, the um, public health and also our safety officer to help us develop plans that we're putting into action. Um, some of these will be a phased approach um, to ensure that we have the comfort level from citizens and also from employees to move forward. Um, we don't have a date set for when we will open the facilities back open to the public, um, but we're working on implementing these specific actions before we can do that. Um, so some of these are include installing plexiglass in our public facing um, counters. Um, and putting signage up in our lobbies to provide guidance to citizens, um, floor markings to ensure social distancing, um, additional facility cleaning, uh, and we've also provided additional supplies to staff. Um, we will be, be providing face coverings to um, the public, um, and we just rolled out today a daily screening tool for employees and also demobilization guidance for staff so those who were reassigned will be coming back to their home departments and of course an emergency incident telecommuting policy so we can allow those folks to t continue to telecommute and these guidelines will be um, coinciding with the governor's guidance around safety and social distancing and that's it if you have any questions let me know all right Sybil thank you so much Okay, um, next up is a discussion about the GE road repair issue, and Tim Love will present this item. Good afternoon, commissioners. There's a presentation we'll use for today's discussion. Max, if we could bring that up, that would be great. Good deal. So uh, as is customary with pre-meeting, we're giving you an update on an issue that you may not have information on previously, but I would plan to bring it back to before the board at our second meeting in June, but we'll, we'll walk through that here in a second. Uh, so GE Aviation, uh, most of you or all of you are familiar that in 2013 GE Aviation uh, agreed to relocate to Buncombe County. Uh, specifically to the Sweden Creek Industrial Park and they took the place of Old Dominion uh, Freight who relocated to a separate part of Buncombe County. Uh, that Old Dominion site was annexed in the year 2001 by the city of Asheville um, and additionally the road off of Sweeten Creek Road which is called Sweeten Creek Industrial Park Road uh, was uh, has always been part of the city's uh, transportation system. As part of the county's uh, economic development agreement with GE Aviation, uh, the county agreed to construct a facility at 502 Sweeten Creek uh, that GE would lease from the county for a period of 19 years. And there's a formal lease agreement that documents that. Um, additionally, separately, there is a facility um, in that same industrial park that GE also, also maintains. That's their facility, though. And I'll show you a map here in a second. Um, the road, so, you know, as, as we come off Sweeten Creek and you take a left and you go on the Industrial Park Road, there's also a spur road, um, which is how you get to our county land and that GE facility. And so that's the piece of road we're going to talk about today. Uh, that piece of land, um, you know, is in question, and so we'll walk that through. Um, since 2013, that road has deteriorated from normal wear and tear, uh, just runoff, things like that. Um, GE approached us as the landlord for that property and said, you know, we, we, we need to do something about this road before it becomes an operations issue. 
Um, as such, uh, county staff met with GE, the Department of Transportation, as well as the City of Asheville to talk about solutions, and that's what we're bringing before you today. So in terms of the property layout, uh, just a quick uh, aerial, uh, you can see uh, there's two GE facilities on the right side. So GE Aviation number one, that's at the bottom center. Uh, so that's the existing facility owned by GE, not of interest to us today, but wanted to orient you. On the right, you see the second facility. This is the facility constructed in and around 2013. Uh, this is a county owned facility and land that is leased to GE uh, for a 19 year term. Uh, you can see with the yellow dots, I've identified the, the city uh, access, the city road, which is uh, Sweeten Creek Industrial Park Drive. And then I've also highlighted in the red dots, the access road that is currently deteriorating. And so that's the road we wanna talk about today. Uh, this road had been in place for a number of years prior to GE uh, when it was used by Old Dominion, uh, but the, the assignment of the property is sort of what's in question. Uh, shifting gears to give you an idea, so why are we even talking about this? Um, if you look on the left side, this is a picture from April 14th of 2020, and you can see there's an issue. Um, the, there's no curbing. Uh, the side of this road is basically just falling off into a ravine. Um, if you look on the right, ten, just 10 days later, you can see that the yellow arrow that had been painted on the ground has fallen off into the ditch. So over a 10-day period, you know, the road is quickly deteriorating um, at this pace. You know, this is not a good thing. Um, <laughs> needless to say, right? Um, Have you checked it this afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's technical terminology. So, um, so with that said, so, you know, as landlord and as a good partner to GE, we, we want to bring this before the board to see if we can get some resolution. Um, the, the road has not become an operations issue yet. Uh, so we're still in front of this. I don't want to draw too much attention to this, but I wanted you to be aware of it. So what's the issue? Why am I here? Um, so who owns the land? Uh, this is where things get a little interesting. I've talked to you about the GE property, and so that, that facility on the, on the top right, we own that. We own the land. We do not own the access road or the land that the access road is on. So that's a right away to that road? Uh, we do have a right of way to that road. Um, so, you know, as we talk about who owns the land, so who owns the land, first bullet says it, DOT owns the land. Um, however, in the year 2014, uh, DOT, um, well, the city uh, passed, city of Asheville passed two resolutions to accept the, both parcels into the city's system. Both resolutions are signed, they're in the appendix, I can show them to you if you'd like to see them. However, uh, the, the deed work was never completed to formally accept uh, that property at, into the city of Asheville. So, um, and that's the third bullet. So the proposed conveyance has never occurred to complete property transfer from DOT to COA, although we do have two resolutions that indicate that was the plan. As we shift to the top right, who owns the facility? We know that that is Buncombe County, and uh, from Buncombe County, GE leases that property for a period of 19 years, and there's, um, you know, additional clauses to extend that if possible, but no need to discuss that today. So then the natural question is, if we own the property and we're leasing it, what are the county's obligations as the leaseholder, as the landlord, if you will? And so the first bullet is pretty explicit. It's to maintain the envelope of the building, the walls, the roof. Um, it is to maintain any county property, you know, so the grounds would apply. However, the road itself is not actually a part of the county's own property. So that puts us in a little bit of a, a situation where clearly we see an obligation as the landlord, but not a technical obligation because it's not literally our land. Uh, third bullet is, you know, by statute, county governments generally do not build, maintain, or repair roads. It's not what we do. Um, so that's why we bring the issue to you. Um, as I've said, we've been in discussions with the city of Asheville, DOT, GE to talk about this, and we have a proposed resolution. And so I'm not asking for a vote today on this, just to give you some background. So Buncombe County proposes, and we've discussed this with the city of Asheville, DOT, and GE, and they agree pending their board's, respective board's approval. Uh, Buncombe County as property owner and landowner, landlord would finance and contract with qualified vendors to design and complete the road repair to the city of Asheville roadway standards. Uh, we say that because this property is in the jurisdiction of the city of Asheville, it connects to a city of Asheville road, 
and because in our second bullet, we'd like the city of Asheville to take o- formal ownership of this access road long term so that if there's future issues with maintenance or road repair, that it's handled by the city of Asheville since the road is in their jurisdiction and since this is something that within statute cities frequently do. So that's our proposed resolution. Um, as with anything, I'm sure you're, you're concerned about what the associated costs would be, what would the timeline be, and that's something we'd like to bring to you at our next meeting um, in June. And so the next steps are to complete initial design for the long-term solution. We would do this by the end of this week, and this is being led by our county team, uh, which is Mike Mays General Services. Uh, we would then go through an informal bidding process. We hope to be concluded by June 5th. Uh, We would then come before the board on or around June 16th, so the second meeting in June, uh, with a proposal, uh, which would include the alternatives we looked at, as well as an agreement to move forward to implement the solution. Uh, The final bullet is to select the contractor, coordinate with the city of Asheville, and mobilize by 626. So as stated before, we would do this in conjunction with the city of Asheville. That way the road is repaired to their standards so that they can accept it and maintain it long term. So a lot of information coming at you there, but do you have any questions about where we're at? So I got I got three. Uh, one is, uh, do we really have to do this, and why? Because um, we don't own the road, right? It's not in the agreement with GE that we do a road. We, we do not own the land, but we do have the easement uh, for the road. Uh, so it's not a slam dunk case, but I think we have clearly some responsibilities here as the landlord. I'm not saying that we shouldn't, right. you know, do it. I'm just wondering, you know, what was GE's position and, you know, why haven't they worked on the road or I was just curious on that, number one. And... Number two, the the um, the land still belongs to the DOT, right? That's correct. Because the city's never uh, transferred it. And do you have any idea why? And why would we expect them to do it? You know, now. Sure, I, I can't speak to why final uh, deeds weren't were, were not recorded. Um, however, I, I think we in our discussions with the city of Asheville. They've agreed in concept to do this um, pending their, their board's official approval. So I, th- I think we, we do have a, a, an agreement there. So, and I'm assuming we would have a hold, uh, whatever it would be called, a hold harmless from GE and, uh, you know, so to, to hold the city accountable for that road so that they wouldn't be coming back to us. If we fix the road and then we turn it over to the city, then we're done. Correct. That's the goal. But, right. So, uh, Commissioner, there's a process now that if a developer built a subdivision and built a road, once it's built to city standards, they can petition the city to add it to their network. We will follow that same standard. So there's nothing special the city will be doing. We have been working with them to make sure that we build it to their standard with the expectation, and they have agreed as a staff level, that if we build it to their roads and we followed it, the same process that a s- developer would follow to put a road into their system, because it's built to their standard and with their work, we would expect that they would accept it. At this point, GE doesn't have any responsibility to fix that road. Okay. It is the county's land that it abuts to. Sure. And it, based on our economic development agreement with GE, we would maintain the facility, we would maintain the grounds. There was no word in there that says the road, but to access their property, they need that spur road. So I think that's why we're here today. And DEOT doesn't really have, in their mind, they deeded it over. It was never completed on our end, at the city's end, but as far as DOT is concerned, they gave us the easement, and they are pretty much walked away from that facility. So yeah, yeah, I would, as a I, good partner, we're proposing that we do this today. I mean, I would, I would think we would, you know, I would think we'd want to do it, but it does concern me that, I mean, that it's never been put over in the city's name, so, you know, we'd have to, I mean, we'd have to make sure of all that before we even consider the, Money. Absolutely. I mean, all that's got to go down at the same time, I guess. Absolutely, and we'll we'll follow that much closer um, this this time. Um, in discussions with Mr. Frew, you know the the access of the property, quite comfort, 
what's the what's your terminology the the access to the facility it's, it's, it's an undefined access right of way so so means it's not on the it's not defined on the it's not defined clearly on the deed is that is that right the old the old chain of title shows a meets and bounds description for the facility along with the right of way to Sweden Creek Road so the right of way is not clearly defined exactly. in that document exactly yeah Tim, can I ask a question? Please. On the picture, these yellow arrows and red lines, was, was that put there because of they're trying to test this, see how quick this road is caving in? Or is there some type of utilities that are running under this road? And so is, is that what, so that's what could have caused this? There, is it the utilities that was put in? or It looks like it's going into a ditch and there's a pipe sticking up right here. You're correct. Uh, there are existing uh, utilities underneath. Um, which is an additional reason to sort of address this issue. Um, it's not, uh, it's not new. It, it's been there, um, the, but the arrows were there to show kind of a, a time, uh, how quickly this is degrading. Yep. And you know, we before bringing this to you, I, I, I want to be clear. We've had way too many conversations on this with the city uh, going back into 2019 and so we we've certainly had many discussions we brought uh, uh, sort of a P PSNC to the table Dominion uh, DOT many of the players to make sure that everyone understood the gravity of the situation uh, but we're at a point where something needs to be done and I, th I think the county uh, believes that as landlord it, it's our responsibility to lead the way Uh, yes, Tim. Uh, are they any estimate? I mean, have y'all looked at, or has anyone looked at an estimate? I know you're waiting to get some bids, but how far are you looking? Ten foot, twenty foot? You know, railroad ballast to hold it up. Right. Uh, we expect that. You know, because the the question we get into is a short term versus a long term fix. You know, do we sure. just drop some riprap down there and see if that'll hold it up for the foreseeable. Uh, so we're looking at uh, both options to see what the best option is to maintain it. It is a very steep uh, ravine and um, there's a significant amount of runoff as well that comes from the parking lots around there. So we wanna make sure that it's a, a longer term solution, but I do not have a price for you, I'm sorry. Okay, and yeah, uh, I don't know if that is correct or not, but you know, we would have to fix it for the city to take it over to meet there. You know, I know we can't put a Band-Aid on it. That's correct. But there is no, no one has said we're looking at 10,000, 100,000 or whatever. I've been given some very rough numbers, but I'm very hesitant to share them with yeah. you because it's not based on any, it was someone, you know, guessing this is what I think it would cost, not based on an engineering or design. Um, but... Um, we will definitely share that information with you when we we come back before the board. Commissioner, were you asking how long would we just fix that, or are we going to try to repave the street? Well, I mean, I, from what I understand, we got to fix it to whatever the city tells us to fix it to, I think, correct, for them to take over? We don't have to do that. Well, we don't have to, but that's what they're saying is well, make it city standards. Right, but their standards are published. Yeah. And the, the engineer that we were using would look at those standards and give us options of, from the least to the most. And then we mm. get to bring that to you guys and have a discussion on which one we would choose. Okay. It, I mean, looking at it and just what I'm hearing here, and I want to find out more about it, looks like all three parties should be responsible for a piece of this. The DOT, city, and county, they all made mistakes here by not trying that's where i think i stand to i learn more about it sure thank you so this is a total re repair of the entire road not just the part that's caving in we're going to fix the entire road to their standard this is the the access road and yeah the access that. road i'm looking at the red so everything in the red um correct areas that, that entire that entire road is that, what we're talking about that bringing it all up to standard that's correct okay. well uh, the, the, the main part is the, the part that is degraded, uh, where it is sort of falling apart. Uh, the, re the remainder of the road is, is in good condition. What's um, that? Say that again, please. The remainder of the road is in good condition. It's really so we're just going to fix what's falling in. That's correct. Oh, okay, and, okay, okay. 
And what we would anticipate is uh, some looking at curb and gutter um, additionally on, on the city side, and they'd have to speak to that, but I think that's a part of the problem, um, which is on the city-owned road, uh, not our access road. But this is years of tractor and trailers leaving there loaded. So is there any way to make sure that two years from now we don't have another part of that road caving in somewhere? Without, without, I mean, can somebody say, hey, look, you know, if you're going to come in and fix this part that is caving in, and if you don't do something else over here, you're going to come back two years from now. Uh, just, as, I don't think it's been mentioned, but one thing to uh, recognize is it, it won't show on that red rectangle. But if you're standing where the slope is failing and look about four or 500 feet into the facility, it has curb and gutter. This one point is approximately 20 or 30 feet long with no curb. And that's where it's that's flowing over. Road. Yes. So hopefully that's the only thing that needs. Water. That's right. So, yeah, but so, according, oh. so the water's going off there and it's just washing out the road. Is yep. it? Or, or it's built on fuel or a combination of all that. It's probably built on fuel, you know, so we're dealing with that too. But I don't want to get in the weeds on that because I'm not a, I'm not a road builder. But yep. that's, from what I remember of the location, there's probably a lot of fuel there. there. That's right. Well, it looks, I mean, just looking at the picture to me, it looks to me like that maybe they took the curb and gutter out when utilities come through there, and that's something else I'd like to look at. Did utilities go and bore under there and not put it back to what it needed? I don't think, as Commissioner Penlin said, it's not actually where the tractor trailers go in and out. The road is actually in pretty good shape, isn't it? It's not, it's an edge where I don't think the trucks are really running at. It looks like a utility problem that over the years it's just washed out. I think that's fair, and Mr. Fru described it well. Uh, it does lack curb and gutter, and you can see kind of the, the runoff. Um, we did pose the question about the trailers themselves um, to the group, and, but we don't, I don't think that's central to it, but there is normal wear and tear, of course. So. When do you expect to have cost estimates? We would like to bring something before the board in the second meeting in June, uh, the 16th. All right. Any other questions? You know, my, um, well, I look forward to hearing the numbers. Uh, I mean, ultimately, it's just someone's got to write a check for this. Sounds like it needs to get done. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I reserve the right to feel differently once I see what the price sure. tag is. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm in agreement with the concept here. I think it seems like a good solution. Um, you know, why this whole thing didn't get buttoned up back then, I don't know if anyone knows. It doesn't matter, it's water under the bridge at this point. But um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's the city's responsibility to pay this bill. I think it's actually very generous of the city to accept the long-term maintenance of this facility. because. It'll need work in the future. You know, hopefully it'll be built well and last a long time, but when it needs to be maintained in the future, they'll have to uh, be responsible for that. And they don't have to do that. So I think it's, it's, it speaks well to Asheville for accepting the long-term maintenance responsibilities of this as part of the city street system. Um, but I don't see that they have an obligation to pay uh, for fixing it right now. So I anyway, I, I, I'll just say, I, I think the concept is good. I hope the price tag's not, uh, not too much, but look forward to you know, learning more about what it really looks like. Be interesting to hear who owns it. You know, when we start talking about the money, too. All right. Any other questions? Thank All you. Right, thank you, Tim. All right. Um, next up is uh, we have Dr. Molinor and Molinor and Fletch Tobe, who are going to give us an update on COVID-19 response efforts. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, so there's a presentation. If they can pull that up. All right. So um, I'll start out by bringing up the dashboard. So this, this is not the updated dashboard. And no chance to see on that. Yeah, it's updated there. Matt, it was, so it's 182 cases and six deaths. 
Um, and yeah, and we do match the, I know yesterday, there, or was that yesterday there was a discrepancy between um, our da dashboard on the website and the state website, and that's been resolved. Yes. Um, and so um, what you can see, or you know, what we talked about last time, we were here about the trends. And so um, it, testing is definitely continues to increase. A lot of that is due to uh, you know, some of the community testing we've done, but also the long-term care facility outbreaks where we've been doing a lot of testing. Um, contact tracing capacity, um, we're good. And we will be able to, starting next week, get support from the um, Community Care of North Carolina uh, staff uh, should we need it. We'll go ahead and probably put in a request uh, um, so we're on the list um, and then um, just kind of see what bears out the rest of this week and um, next week to see if we do need to pull those staff in. Um, okay, thank you. Um, and I'll speak to, um, also just on there, just to, in case somebody had a question about, there are some unknowns now on the race and ethnicity and gender, and that's just trying to get that information from the long-term care facilities and trying to get that entered in. It's, as you can imagine, it's a lot of, um, a lot of balls in the air and um, staff um, trying to get that information from a facility that's in the throes of managing an outbreak uh, and then get it, um, entered into the spreadsheet from which the dashboard is created. So we're actively working to remedy that. Um, and so, um, well, while I'm waiting for that to come up, um, I would say in terms of the, there we go, there it is. Um, so just as I said, so we're right around 4,000 um, tests administered. And what I would say is actually, um, Again, just with the logistics of getting information from the long-term care facilities as we're doing that testing, um, I'm actually thinking that, that that number is probably closer to like a, almost a thousand times more because um, we did a thousand tests just within one the first week at long-term care facilities and they've already started like their second round of testing. So um, uh, again, it's just uh, trying to get data in um, and um, under pretty significant circumstances. Um, all right. So, um, so I'd say, yeah, we're, I think he can go to the next. Oh, it's me now. Sorry, I'm switching over. <laughs> um, well, I guess I'll say in terms of um, cases, yeah, definitely our case count has jumped up, not just related to long-term care facilities, though. There is definitely other, there are other um, community spread happening, um, and it's really linked to places where people congregate together in close settings, right? So we do, do we know that for sure? Uh, um, yeah. When we get out, when we get outside of the nursing homes? I mean, the, another little cluster we have going on is related to people in close contact with others outside so, their immediate household. So where else is where else are the the congregation issues besides nursing homes? Where, where well, I mean, it's like uh, where people might go, um, like uh, the things that are allowable under funerals. Okay, Funeral, so you know that we, kind of setting. But are we specifically saying that? People that have attended funerals in Buncombe County, ha, ha, that this is where that we're finding that those positive mm -hmm. tests are coming from. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to say it. Yeah, that's well, what we're seeing. Can we can we prove it? Do we have numbers yeah. to show that? Uh, yeah, I mean, our People case is consistent with what we're seeing. On for it's very tragic, but and nobody needs to get defensive on this. It's no, pretty, I'm saying I can say, yeah. Pretty simple question. Yes. Yeah, if we if we say that it's where people are congregating, then people really want to know. Right. Okay. If is that a park? Is that a no? It's not is that a funeral home. Is that a yeah? So I say it's household clusters, right? So many of our cases um, recently, you know, live in large households, right? And so we know that your biggest risk is where you're in most direct close contact. So households are huge, right? Um, and then, um, so that's really driving our case count up. And then, yeah, the situations with funeral, funeral settings. 
Well, it'd be good to it'd be good to to whatever extent we could show that to 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 show that. Yeah, I mean, again, it's it's a tough like I have to have that filter in my brain of like I'm with you. Yeah, um, I'm not trying to put you on yeah, spot. No, I'm just, no, I know I'm you're just not. thinking out loud based on the not. information. So I know you're not. I just yeah. kind of ask kind of a kind of a related question. You know, of the of the um, of the maybe kind of another way of, of asking the question is of the cases we have and what and look what percentage of the cases ballparkish is it possible to discern where someone you know where someone got it? Because obviously all, we're all well, I hope yeah. most people are really trying to do social distancing, not go out much. Maybe people who really, really don't have to go out much, if they did go to something, it might be pretty obvious. Like, that's probably yeah. where you got it, because you've otherwise yeah. just been completely by, yourse by yourself. But for most of us, there's some level of, you know, interaction with people that you just can't avoid. So is it, is it um, I don't know, how often do we, are we able to, to kind of, with confidence, discern, here's probably the pretty kind of often. situation. Yeah. Pretty often. Really? Okay. Yeah. And again, like if, I mean, it's pretty apparent when it's a household and a whole bunch of people, you know, and then when you, you know, you find these networks and these connections that, you know, people went to this gathering. Right. Right. And then we see network, you know, families out of that. Sort um, of yeah. It's what the contact tracing is all about. And so it's, and early on it was like, oh, this person went on a cruise and oh, this person's from New York or, or came from New York. Like, Pretty often we're able to figure out. Mm -hmm. um, now it's like tracing, tracing it all the way back to where was the actual initial. That that is often where we don't know. But okay. yeah, and so um, I mean, it, it's just bearing out that how close contact is so like this is how it spreads. Um, and that's something that we'll um, you know we'll continue to be able to do as different as different you know different parts of the economy you know are allowed to resume some level of operations we'll, we'll be able to continue to look at that to kind of get more and more information about you know here are the areas where you know here's the kind of facility mm -hmm. that creates the highest level of risk right and so we'll we'll just be able to continue learning as we go and also of course this is happening all over the country so we're kind of seeing right. how that works in other places that are at some other stage of reopening than we are yeah and we also know a lot already i mean funerals, churches, birthday parties, I mean, basically yeah. daycares. We saw, I mean, just within a couple hour radius of here, we've seen churches in Georgia that have now have to close again, a daycare center in Henderson County has a positive case. So I think we, there's not, it's not that there's not more to learn, but I think we could today probably create a pretty comprehensive list of the places where outside of one's home and one's workplace, groups of people from different households gather. And each of those, it's really, really hard, but each of those is risky. So in some, I mean, it's always helpful and important to say, this event might have been a place mm -hmm. where it happened, but, we, but that's always very reactive. And I think the mindset is really, we, we, we kind of know a lot of this already. Yeah, I, you know, I, and I guess my question I think the chairman summarized it, you know, pretty good, is that specifically in Buncombe County, if there are places or events that we're concerned about, I think people are not interested in getting their news from other places. They'd like to know what's going on here and how they can be safe here. Yeah. And um, they certainly don't want to get it off Facebook some of the other places which are scaring people absolutely to death. They need to have good common sense, good facts and numbers. And so if funerals are an issue, then you know we need to, we need to know that. I get that the more you congregate together that the risk goes up. You know, but specifically in Buncombe County, it'd be good to, to have some of the information that, that, mm -hmm. that you have. Um, yeah, and I'm in relation to some of those, <laughs> in, in relation to, you know, where, where we think, you know, if this is the issue here in Buncombe, this is the issue in here in Buncombe, instead of it's everywhere. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, again, it's that, you know, what I personally am trying to avoid, right? Like, it's close, you know, lots congregated with people. I mean, I go leave work and I go home and it's me and my son and my husband. And, like, I don't, you know, we're out. We just stay away from other people because... That's just the safest place <laughs> to be right now. So, um, 
yeah, it's like you're, you know, putting logs on the fire, right? The more people you add in, potentially. Mm -hmm. So, um, so. Uh, I have a question before we go further, okay? Yeah, go Because uh, I'm lost, and I know anybody watching this is probably lost with me. Mm -hmm. So, large gatherings, we know the larger the group of people, the mm -hmm. better chance it is. Mm -hmm. But we just started funerals Friday of 10 to 50. So 10 people is still a lot of people. Yeah. I I'm just saying, if the household's of the size of like five and six i mean i'm just being honest like any any group of people that's and i i get it um but it doesn't take i mean 10 has become this you know was this chosen as this number but i don't really know what's safe about 10 mm -hmm. if they're especially if it's people who aren't in your immediate household right um I'm just being honest. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm trying to get an answer to tell the people out there. And I think what I heard is Buncombe County. We ain't talking about no other county. I'm Buncombe. Mm -hmm. Since we've up the 50 people funeral, we can really say that well, I can't they have been, this disease has spread people. from these funerals in the last week. I can't say it has anything to do with a 50 people funeral. Like I said, I think it, it goes back even further. You okay. know what I mean? With like the 10. Yeah. So we had a good number of people yeah. when they was funerals that passed this on. I mean, yeah, I think that that, Are again. they a number? I mean, and, and all I'm doing is trying to find an answer to tell all these constituents out here that are asking me. Oh, Nobody's giving us numbers. We're hearing about I th North Carolina. I think it has Carolina. to do with the We're close contact, right? So, like, you can have 10 people, 10 people spread out, right? And that's one thing. But it's 10 people maybe not maintaining the social distancing, right? That's the big, the, the, the physical distancing, the not wearing face coverings, that kind of stuff. I yeah. think that's the part, right? You can have 10 people, but if they're following all that other guidance, the risk is very much lower it's it's more about what are you doing in that group of 10 people yeah. or five people or whatever right and all i'm doing is speaking for yeah, uh, no, 200,000 people here in buncombe right. county is this close quarters and we're saying large households funeral homes have we got any data on the hardware stores and you know the hardware stores i'm talking about i don't yeah. want to mention how many of them have passed it on in the yeah, hardware that's stores? Not, that's not something that's coming up on our. No, it's radar, not, but right. it's coming up from. Yeah, no, we're I'm, not I'm practicing saying that's not it at them stores. So. Right, because again, if if you're not, if you're again walking by somebody on the sidewalk, that's not the risk, right? It's the close contact, six feet, yeah. um, ten minutes or more. The you know that that's the that's the part where we're. Oh, yeah. We're and I, I mean, I appreciate everything, staff, you're doing, yeah. Fletch, everyone. But, I mean, they are coming at us hard of why we're, and I've got to have answers because I can't say, well, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, yeah. I can't stutter around. Where are we need to be working the hardest at? I mean, Funeral I think homes, it's people, large, like I still, like hardware I said stores. yesterday, I think it's still like, I see, still see tons of people out there without their cloth faith coverings while they're out and about. I mean, like just leaving work at late on Friday night. I saw so many people downtown. Um, maybe not a lot of people downtown, but the people I saw, none of them had cloth face coverings. None of them. They were closed. So, so I think you'll see. I, th I, th I think when it comes to face coverings and things like that, that if people are not coming into contact with others. You know, then there. I mean, I've seen people with face mask on inside the car. Yeah, okay. it's an extreme. Like, and I'm talking. like, I mean, and it, everybody, everybody has their own. And they, and they, they, if they want to do that, pardon me. It may have been an Uber driver. Well, mm -hmm. I don't think it was an Uber driver. <laughs> but, yeah. But so, anyhow, so the and they could have been an Uber driver. And the point is, is that it, it, it really, it really doesn't matter if they want to wear their mask, face mask. That's fine. That's great. I'm just saying there's all kinds of different levels. You know, if yeah, I do the shopping for my family, and when I go out, I wear a muff. And if I'm in a situation where I'm uncomfortable or there's somebody close to me that looks uncomfortable, then I make sure that, that I'm looking out after them more than 
than really I am myself because I'm, I'm going to keep my distance. I'm going to do what makes sense and all that. I just think that if there's some areas in, uh, in Buncombe where there's still concerns, unfortunately and fortunately, after we made the decision to align the funeral homes, the next, uh, so like three days after that, I think, I went to a funeral the first time. My neighbor's father unexpectedly died. The funeral home was amazing. They they done just an incredible job. The people were were doing their best yeah. to practice social distancing. Uh, I will go on the record. There was a there was a few few hugs going on. Yeah. But but that's that has those things during certain times have to happen because the the they just it's just part of life yeah. and you can't you can't stop it but if there are areas where we are seeing concentrations that we can tell people specifically you know other than just keep me around 10 people and like you said i, I don't know where that number come up that was there yeah. we just I know. Pull that out of the air, I guess, because yeah. I think at the state it was 50 when we first started, and then we said 10. Is that right? Well, in other places, there, 10 has been. Ten's they're just, like these round numbers. 10 the number. Yeah. yeah, 10 was a good round number. Yeah. So I just get worried, like, I think as we're coming upon Memorial Day, right? And so I, what do people like to do on Memorial Day, right? Have cookouts. And so I just I think we're all a little um, on our, you know, a little uneasy. Um, again, um, just want people to recognize that. Because I've read things in the paper, you know, people are like, oh, it's just people in long-term care facilities who are dying from this, and that's not true, and they got to get it from somewhere, right? Like, we're all in this, we're all connected, we're all part of this, and I just want people to recognize that while you think you aren't at risk, like, you may get it, pass it on to somebody else who passes it on to somebody else who then leads to an outbreak in a long-term care facility, right? So I just want people to be mindful of that. And take our guidance seriously. Yeah. Um, Dr. Baldor, can you tell me the, from the beginning when we started testing, the percentage of positive versus now with the number of tests we have as to far, was that percentage staying somewhat same or is it increasing? The percent positive. So I went back, I just went back um, to I think it was the 8th of May and looked at it there and that calculated, again, we have to remember these are rough estimates because the we don't have necessarily all the number of tests that have been done, but it was about 3% positive um, back on May 8th. And then when I look at now, again, if I, if I leave out, like my, my range would be anywhere from 3.6 to 4.6% positive now. So our percent positivity is going up based on my calculations of the numbers that we have. And, and, do and we again, know that's worrisome of, to Okay, me. do we know of the 182 positive, yeah. conf or the lab confirmed case, how many of those have recovered? Do we know that? Um, so that's where it gets tricky, right? We stopped reporting that when, a while ago because the state was like, there is no definition for recovered, right? And there have been, there were circumstances where people were released from isolation and then actually worsened after it. Um, and so I was just like, there's no definition. Um, I, it's giving false sense of security people to people potentially. So I, we just stopped doing that. Um, I know the state has recently changed and come up with their way of doing it. Uh, what we, race, re, we track now is who's still under isolation. Um, I don't have that off the top of my head since I don't report that out anymore, but that's kind of how we do it. But just knowing that you, you could be released from isolation based on guidelines, and that doesn't mean you're out of the woods necessarily. I think, and I think giving people information like that allows them to make a very personal decision. It's like it's like church, you know. It's a that's going to be a very that's a it's a very personal decision. Um, it's just a very personal decision people are going to make based on input and based on information that you that, that you give out. And so the recovery, uh, it was interesting. I was noticing that whether it was uh, WLOS or Channel 21, either one, they're just reporting cases and deaths. And so there's, there's a lot of positive and negative between there, yeah. you know, and that recovery uh, and the amount of people still in the hospital or that's been in the hospital is, is good information for people to take and to, uh, and to process, I think, so. 
But you're doing a great job. I appreciate you being able to answer it. Try to yeah, I'm help trying. us with. Yeah, I know you are, and you're really doing a great job. And I appreciate you trying to help us through this, yeah. so that we can try to encourage, you know, and and help those that we come in contact with. So. And uh, can I just ask Dr. Millendor, do you have yes. more presentation to give? Because well, we, we do have a, a few yeah. more minutes, but not a lot of time. So I want to make sure you it's get through everything you want to share to us. Well, I mean, yeah. I can talk to you about um, any of this. Uh, okay. All right. Let's let's hold questions for a minute. Let them finish giving okay. us all the information they want to share today. And, okay. and and we can go over. This is really important, so we don't have to start okay. our other meeting at five. We can yeah, want us to sure. take the time to hear all this information. Okay. So just want to give updates, long-term care facilities. So as I mentioned yesterday, um, once we have a lab confirmed case and a staff or resident at a long-term care facility, um, we we go in and we do a site visit with a communicable disease nurse, environmental health um, inspector, and we work with those facilities to make sure they get all staff and residents tested. And um, they've all been very, um, cooperative and compliant it is it is significantly like challenging to do all this I will say um, despite uh, there being better lab capacity it's still a lot to test 200 people um, in one fell swoop or in like you um, and then amount of like so you need testing supplies um, which you know it takes maybe so there's some lag time to get those you need PPE you need staff um, just the logistics of like filling out all those lab requisitions and then getting all those I mean it's these are not um, simple things to do but these uh, facilities and our community partners have really worked well together with us to get this stuff done and then we're we're the state doesn't have any new guidance yet um, and so we were basically following that CDC potential guidance of repeating testing about three days again logistically sometimes three days just can't happen but about three days later and then weekly until you don't get any new positives so we're on second round of testing at most facilities this week um, and um, so it takes a lot of effort and a lot of people stepping up to help out um, and um, really just we have this um, team of uh, individuals from EMS and the fire, depart fire departments who are working together to go into these facilities and really um, not just the ones with the outbreaks, but even the ones without to, to really make sure, like call them, make sure they're doing their infection control practices, make sure they have everything they need. PPE, have you, are you linked to a, a lab that can do your testing? Have you thought through all these things? And then actually today we pulled um, all of them together for a, it's sort of like a learning collaborative. So those who have outbreaks are sharing what they're learning with those who don't yet to sort of say, here, here's what you need to know in preparation and how to prevent. And so it's, it's again, really the community coming together to f figure this out um, when um, maybe the guidance uh, and um, support from other levels isn't there. So um, it's good to see. Um, and um, in terms of Community testing. So last week we had two um, two um, events uh, that Western North Carolina Community Health Services partnered with us on. About 100 people tested, and um, today got rained out, thunderstormed out, whatever. Um, and we'll see what the rest of the week holds. But that is um, an issue when you're trying to do outdoor testing. Um, and then yeah, the testing guidance that changed last week. Um, you know, to really kind of encourage testing of anybody. Um, who is in a high risk or high priority group? I, you know, I, again, the state has um, got some supplies from FEMA and is, has set up some processes for providers can go in, order supplies, and get them. Uh, again, it's just our, you know, our healthcare. Everything is so piecemeal in this country sometimes, and it's just this. This pandemic has really um, done a great job of showing the weaknesses in our healthcare system, um, in our society, um, and and we're just trying to make. Um, to get testing to the people that need testing and then to make sure people understand what testing is. We have to remember testing is a snapshot in time. If you have a negative test, it doesn't mean that you're free and clear and you can stop wearing your face coverings. And um, it, you, know, you could get tested three days later and be positive. And so how to message that to the community and how to make sure that um, that um, providers have the resources they need in order to um, get their get the people tested who need tested. So that's what we're trying to work on uh, while we're um, managing all the other stuff we're trying to manage. Um, 
in terms of uh, the trajectory. So these are trends the uh, state's been following, and these are our sort of signals of where we think we're at. So the syndromic-like, uh, COVID-like syndromic cases, this is like um, something that we get from the for the region, the Western region. And so while it looks like the people who are visiting emergency departments for COVID-like illness is tracking down, that's going in the right direction. As I mentioned before, our trajectory of cases over the last two weeks and our trajectory of percent positive is not going in the right direction right now. And then hospitalizations, uh, so far, you know, the um, counts have been pretty low. Um, uh, and um, what else was I gonna, anything else about that? So capacity is still there um, right now. So um, I think that's where I'm done. I'm gonna bow out to uh, Fletch. All right, thank you, Dr. Mullendor. Um, Good afternoon. I just wanted to give you guys an update of what we know so far about uh, what phase two may potentially look like. Uh, we know currently phase one is set to expire on Friday at 5 p.m. This is the extent. So just, just to be very clear, this is Governor Cooper's framework. This is the extent of what we know so far about what may possibly be entailed in phase two. Um, we're hoping, he said midweek, we'd have more details. So either Wednesday or Thursday, we're looking for more specifics. From there, we'll digest those lo locally and, and give public health recommendations going forward. And I think that's um, yeah, extend what we have. So commissioners and Fletch, if you don't go too far. Um, last time in phase one, we all decided that we would stick with the governors and align ourselves with the governors. So as this is getting ready to go to phase two, that will be the question. Um, we have the one restriction on travel, so if we want to talk through what that looks like as we start preparing our version to bring back to you as soon as we hear what the governor is. We wanted to talk a little bit about that this evening, so if you want to talk about that. Right, so I think um, well, we had initially put that initial restriction on leisure travel from outside the 828 area code, and I think looking at our other trends are going up, um, that on the 22nd we can relax that restriction on travel, leisure travel from outside the 828 area code. Do you think, Fletcher, do you think we're going to stay in the 50% with, um, with the hotels, or is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, we, we've, we've had that discussion um, at some capacity level, and also um, we're, we're looking at some other jurisdictions' guidance on having time in between rooms, and we're, we're having that discussion. We have more town halls uh, scheduled with lodging um, providers later this week. Yeah. But I, th I think we're, um, we can open that up to more leisure travel. Okay. So, the, so the protocol as <clears throat> currently being envisioned is maximum 50% capacity. Um, every other room has to remain unoccupied. And in, in some period of time between when one guest leaves and the next one uh, would be able to stay there but the duration of that still being looked at to figure out what's the what makes sense on that point is that are those the main we're looking kind of protocol at, issues yeah 24 hours seems to be mm -hmm. um and part of the reasoning is it allows people if there is you know droplets in the air it gives it time to settle and then the time to clean the room thoroughly mm -hmm. before going back in but we're, we're still having those discussions but that's yeah that's something along those lines okay okay are you looking for input or Yes, if that was in line with where you were thinking, if there's other things you want us to talk through, we can put back up that phase two. If there's anything on that list the governor has laid out that nice. we had concerns about, we can talk through those. So as we start drafting our recommendations, and we'll bring that back to you before there's an order, but we want to get some ideas of where you were thinking. Thank you. Um, where I personally would land is that I think we need to take very seriously that both our case count and our rate of positivity are increasing. Um, those feel like two of the most important trends we're tracking. Um, it's obviously good that we have hospital capacity, but um, I, the fact that in the last week we've seen outbreaks at four long-term care facilities and we've seen our numbers more than triple in the last month, I believe, um, just raises concerns for me. Our, num our overall case count is obviously significantly below a place like other counties in the state, and that's, I hate that for them, but it's, fortunate for people in our community, but um, I would personally land on the side of really making a, a local decision um, 
based on what the data is telling us and erring on the side of uh, public safety and public health even and staying in based if we were making the decision today which we're obviously not I would cast my vote for staying in phase one until we have a sense of where the data is headed and we really start to see those trends either flatten or decrease thank you is there a a threshold level, for lack of a better phrase, to know when to pull back as well as we move into phase two. Right. I think um, as, as we see, um, we don't have any input yet from public health because we don't know what phase two right. will look like. But I think um, as we look at if we do have to regress, we'd have the same kind of triggers. We see cert certain spikes, trends in our epi curve, which we, we know we're seeing a gradual increase. But... Um, you know, as, as we get more time and more data, we'll be able to tell whether that's coming, you know, at, at an exponential rate or at an alarming rate, and not more so than just the correlation of increased testing and a small increase, whether it's an actual increased testing and a big increase outside the testing. And, and we're also receiving information from all these sectors through the town halls, through their, their plans where they're working, you know, closely with staff and the state and the county and in trying to you know get in front of this to make sure that you know whatever is done is done you know safely and cautiously so it's not like people are sitting on their hands I mean they're they're getting ready um, right beyond anything they've ever done in the in the in the past you know so where our expectations will be you know and I will say you know we touched over 600 businesses through those town halls. And I will say the most consistent feedback we got across all those town halls was businesses asking for us to mandate face coverings in Buncombe County. So that's the, the number one from every town hall. That was the feedback we got. And that continues to be echoed. So we're determining that. We know no jurisdiction in the country has been able to successfully enforce it, but some people have made that mandatory. Um, we know that the data and science shows that can significantly reduced transmission so that's that's information we're looking at from public health that for our recommendations as we get what information we'll see from the governor Fletcher so so I understand if if the governor decides to go to phase two I'm sorry stays in phase one then we're going to relax the 828 reservations so we're going to open up to uh, on May 22nd we're open to, to all over Th that's that's what you're saying I think we can consider that because over the last two weeks, when we made that determination, we haven't. We were concerned that where where our new cases would be coming from, from our contact tracing and from our trends, they're not coming as we feared from out of state. That that may change in the future, but that was a driving point. You know, this is all data driven from numbers we're looking at. We haven't seen that threat we were concerned about, so I think we can make that recommendation of relaxing that on the 22nd. But um, you know, we'll continue to watch those trends, and as we open up, if we we may see that we have to be, we have to assume some risk. And throughout phase phase one and phase two, as we relax restrictions, we're all assuming risk, knowing that the decisions we're making will undoubtedly lead to increased cases and more deaths. But we just have to we're putting in mitigation factors to uh, prevent that and minimize that as much as possible. Okay, and so. Phase two, we may know tomorrow, he said midweek, but it could be Thursday. You know, the thing it is, could, though, the, yes. the profession I come from, you plan. So I think if you say Thursday, we're going to relax phase two Friday at 5 o'clock. That didn't give anybody a chance to plan, but nonetheless, that's what it is. But if, if the governor goes into phase two, then I, will rec I would recommend that Buckingham County follows phase two. And the reason I do that is because of the stories that we hear I was on the phone yesterday for 20 minutes. A guy said, I'm at the end of my rope. I haven't got any assistance, blah, 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 you know. And, and so I, I think it's, it, it would be I could support going into to phase two. We know the virus is there. It's, it's here. And we got to let people decide, hey, you have to protect yourself. But we can't say, well, we're going to keep you from, if you don't want to protect yourself from going somewhere else, we got to give our folks the freedom to make the choice. And the last thing that I would like to ask is, you say that you would like for us to mandate businesses to wear face coverings. I mean, if you go into a business, it says shoes and shirts required. So can they not mandate that themselves to say, you will not come in this business without a mask? 
Yes, they can mandate it. And we found the statute and um, we're, we're pushing signage for them to post. Okay. And they, they have they can enforce that in their businesses. And if people will comply, they can charge them with trespassing as if they came in without shoes or a shirt. But the, the feedback we're getting is these businesses want a an order to point to to strengthen their case. And that's just that's not a public health opinion at this point. That's just what the feedback we're getting from uh, those town halls we had. Yeah, and I think I've, I'm hearing, you know, I'm hearing both that the businesses will make those decisions, and what I what I'm seeing is that um, they like they like some guidance, but they like the freedom to be able to to do it and and uh, um, and and make that decision. Where I was at. Um, it's, it's still amazing to me when I go to to Ingalls or wherever that that the the workers are working that full time shift, you know, in in the, in the mask, and that they're able to do that. And uh, I just hats off to them because that's a, that's that's a, that's a tough thing to do for eight hours. It really is. But uh, yeah, I think that's probably accurate, Fletch. I have a question um, on this topic. Um, <clears throat> is there is there any way of knowing? I mean, we all kind of through the things we do, go to the grocery store, whatever we're doing out. We're all looking around. How's it, how's it going? You know, what do we have any? Um, but do we have any like objective data on like what percentage of people visiting you know retail or other kind of mm -hmm. commercial facilities, public facilities? Like what's our current utilization on like face coverings? I know it's I know it's more than it used to be, but you know that's there's a lot of reasons for that. But where do you, we have a sense for where kind of where we stand today? I'm only aware of an anecdotal evidence. Um, myself and Dr. Mondor observing ourselves, hearing reports through these town halls of what people are seeing in town. Um, I know Durham um, has reported a very large level of compliance, so we're trying to find out how they're objectively finding a data point for that because it's it's really tricky how, do, how how would you know other than having people out counting or taking tallies as people walk in the stores how many people are wearing masks so we're, we're looking to other um jurisdictions to see how, who, who are reporting this number of compliant the percentage of compliance to see how they're tracking that and durham's the only county in the state that currently makes it a requirement not just a you know, strong encouragement but it's a requirement in durham county to the extent of my knowledge, that's correct. Yes, it is. Yeah. I yeah, it'd be, it'd be, um, uh, yeah, I, there probably isn't any way to do it unless you did, like, literally commission a survey and probably would need to do it several times to kind of see what, what the trends are. But um, is there any way that, that, that we've been, you know, as a community, country, other countries going through this to get a sense for, how much of a difference it makes in terms of kind of like overall, you know, this whole like R factor. If it's above one, it means the numbers mm -hmm. are going up. If it's below one, it's going down. If it's, if it's one, it's just steady. Like how big of a difference that one thing makes? Because there's, you know, there's washing hands, there's staying apart. There's all these different things we can do to help or to increase risk. So where does this fit in with that? So we know from recent studies from the CDC and other uh, medical journals that um, I've, I've seen a, a, between 75 and 80 percent reduction in transmission, particularly if multiple parties are wearing masks. Um, so if, if just the tra transmitter is wearing a mask or just the receiver is wearing a mask, there's lower transmission. If both people or groups are wearing masks, it significantly hampers the potential for transmission. Um, we know other countries who have different cultures and can enforce very strictly, you know, everyone, if you're out wearing a mask to the extent as Vietnam would, were putting people in jail for eight months if they weren't wearing masks, um, have some of the best responses in the world to this. So yeah. we know through scientific studies that masks can significantly reduce transmission. And one of the studies we saw last week is that 80%, if we get 80% of the public wearing those, we could severely hamper and maybe even cease the transmission of COVID-19. Which I don't think we'll ever get to that level of compliance, but every little bit is going to help reduce transmissions. And anytime we could break a chain of transmission, we're going to significantly reduce our overall okay. outcomes. All right. Do you have other info you want to no. share with us tonight, Fletch? Are you no. Um, as soon as we get the governor's guidance, we will um, take a look from a public health point of view and push our recommendations to you. All right.
Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Just that, yeah, I'm going to echo uh, Commissioner Penland. Uh, you know, we spent two days of talking about following the governors, and I, I think we need to stay there until we see something different. But what you're saying about masks and gloves, uh, I totally agree. Everyone's mm -hmm. got a mask. They are helping. And I would say absolutely masks. Um, we've never given guidance or the CDC has given guidance on gov gloves. Uh, we actually, some, some people do, though. And it's yeah. so it's so confusing. Yeah. It is it is absolutely confusing. I mean, you I've seen people going into grocery stores wearing gloves, and I'm thinking you touching everything in there, and you're yeah. touching your phone, you're touching your face, and you're wearing gloves, and so and some people feel a little bit like that on 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 masks. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you have to you have to realize that. I'll just tell you, for me, and and for people that. Um, and I don't I don't have any trouble breathing or anything like that but people that have trouble or it's if people are not going to be around a lot of people they don't wear them and so they don't want a mandate to wear them mm -hmm. and so um, plus they don't they don't like being told that anyhow you know particularly you know if they're my age but and I'm at the age where they're probably you know need need the protection but um, it's just interesting the information the type of mask cloth mask mm. you know what do you wear you know you do you take it off right you know there's just so much stuff you know around that so I mean given simple guidance is probably okay in my book mandates right. for me or not so, so if you indulge me I'll take a second to try to clear some of that up um so you know, Dr. Mullendorf can jump in if I misspeak but we're not suggesting the general public wear gloves there's a much higher risk of cross contamination, a false sense of security from gloves. We know people tend to spread it, spread diseases more when they wear gloves. There are specific professions where they're handling either materials or high rate of frequency where they should be wearing gloves. But the general public, ha general basic hygiene and hand washing is the best solution in that. Absolutely. And then for face coverings, everybody, if you're out in a public space where you can't consistently maintain six foot of distance, or you're going to be in a location indoors with a bunch of people for a prolonged period of time should wear some sort of face covering. Yes, uh, and I wanted to finish there. And uh, the face covering and the gloves, the thing that I wish we would mandate more than anything else and get out across is you go in to the grocery stores, the Lowe's, Home Depot's, any of the places, and we're seeing all the people wear gloves, or not all, majority of people wearing gloves and masks. And they walk out the door, and right there is a trash can. And they've touched everything in the store, almost everything, and throw them on the ground. And now we've got high school kids or retired people going out picking them up. Now, where are we spreading more germs and picking up all the litter that these people are concerned about their self instead of everyone else or using the trash can? I think that's something we need to look at and I'm hearing it from uh, store managers that they're taking every protocol they can of sending kids out there or adults to pick them uh, gloves up I mean absolutely I, you know, that selfishness is I guess that's where I'm getting at mm -hmm. is they are concerned about their self and not anybody else except their self yes sir all right Mr. Chairman I say one yes, thing sir. yes sir Fletch that study about the the both people wearing masks. Mm. Could you send? I mean, because that that's that's pretty important. That's a message we could get out there to say, you want to see phase two, you're going to have to you know put on a mask because this is what the study is showing. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I'll push those. Thank you. Mm. All right, uh, Dr. Mullendorf Fletch. We appreciate you both very much. Thanks for staying uh, with us this evening. We went over time a little bit, but I'm glad we did. Um, so let's, uh, commissioners, let's, uh, there was one item left, but let's just push that out to our next uh, meeting. It's about just looking at what we want to call these meetings. We call it a pre-meeting, but do we want to keep calling it that or something else? So we'll, we'll take this up at our next one. Uh, it's not time sensitive. So, but let's take a, um, let's, That's let's good. take like a seven or eight minute break and then we'll start oh, a regular gosh. meeting. Okay.